I originally started out with uh, uh, intending to talk about um, uh, diversity in MIMO here, but uh, actually decided uh, to switch to talking about um, a special case of latency in GNU radio flow graphs, um, which was in originally inspired by a company uh, giving a talk at the Atlanta GRCon back in, I think it was 2012, uh, called Skybox, and they had a problem that we, we named the Skybox problem. Um, and, and came up with a solution for it, but never actually implemented it till now. Um, Skybox is no longer around, but I think the problem was still there, and it's a general thing uh, in GNU Radio, so uh, that's uh, the motivation for this talk. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll start uh, with the problem statement. So first, what is latency? And I think everybody has a good idea um, about what latency is, but um, uh, where it comes from and how to deal with it is not always uh, as clear. So um, I, I divided uh, latency really into, in, in, as occurs in a good radio flow graph, into three categories. Uh, so first is inherent. Uh, this is just the basic time that it takes to do your computation. It's, it's kind of unavoidable. So if you have to do a bunch of ads and an FFT, well, you're going to need to um, do all those computations. So the time from your input to your result uh, uh, you know, has a certain minimum latency to it. Um, the next I would call scheduler induced. And so, uh, and, and I would say the scheduler does a very good job of uh, minimizing that. Can somebody turn this slightly down? That's a little loud. Um, uh, ske uh, scheduler induced latency uh, is things like um, I, I have to add some numbers, but the scheduler does its best to, to make it as efficient as possible in the bandwidth sense, so it gives me a thousand numbers to add. And so I add all the thousand numbers and then I send it along. Um, whereas if I just done one, that, that one could have percolated along and might have reduced the latency in the system. And so that's, that's scheduler induced. And that, that's really um, a trade-off between uh, bandwidth and processor efficiency and latency. And, um, and I think the, the flow, the GNU Radio scheduler does a, a pretty good job of managing that. Um, as things get faster and faster, you kind of want to do work in bigger and bigger chunks. Um, but uh, what, what really... Um, we're talking about in, in this talk is, uh, uh, I, I didn't mean the lights, I meant the sound, but that's cool too. Um, <laughs> lights, lights are good. Um, uh, but really what I'm talking about here is buffer induced latency. And, um, and this is, uh, I think, the biggest problem that, that we see in, in certain types of applications, specifically those that have continuous streaming. Um, so, uh, so what really causes it and, and when is it a problem? So, so first of all, it's, this is generally a, a, only a TX problem, and it's most obvious when you're doing something relatively narrow band, um, but, uh, but it, it's, it's always there. You just may not see it um, if, you're not, uh, if you're not really concerned about latency. Um, but I, I'm going to a, show a, a flow graph here to do a quick demonstration of this. So uh, this is pretty simple. We've got a signal source on the left. Uh, we've got uh, multiplied by a constant, so this is essentially turning it on and off, and that's controlled by a, a GUI push button. So when you press it, it, it turns on the sine wave, or sets the amplitude to one, and when you release the button, it goes back to zero. I add in some noise just so there's something there, even when you're not uh, generating a signal, so you can see things updating. Add that together, and it goes to a GUI sync, and then uh, to simulate just doing a little bit of computation. We have this add const block, and then it goes to audio, and it goes to the GUI time sync. Now, I don't know if you guys will hear the audio when it comes out, but you'll see it on the, uh, on the display. So, so I will run this, and no. So you're definitely not going to hear that, and unfortunately, we may not even see it that well um, at this resolution. Maybe I should go back to the other resolution and just deal with the small fonts. Um, sorry about that, folks. Um, Let's, let's switch this. So um, what, what you'll see here is that we have, um, OK, so you, we have two, two displays. The upper one is the first uh, uh, GUI sync. And then the second one is after all we do is add a constant of zero to it, and then you see it on the second one. And it's also going to audio, which, of course, you're not hearing. Um, and so I'm going to click on this little button in the middle. And OK, so actually, you can hear that. Um, 
So the, when I press it, first you see some latency between when I press it and when the top sine wave appears, but you also see some between the top and the bottom. Now that's not too bad, but this would make, for anybody who does, does Morse code in, in ham radio, this would make it difficult to use because there's this delay. Um, but now, let's, let's say we, we did something with a little bit more complex computation, which I'll simulate just by having a lot of adders in it. And so instead of um, this, we'll... Small fonts are okay, and then we will send the same output uh, into into the same places, right? And and of course, as you see here, since we have an audio sync and everything's running at forty eight kilohertz, that is what is setting the the processing in the system. So now we do that. And this, you know, it's a few blocks, so it's a moderate amount of processing. But I click on this, and let's, let's, and I click on it, and the top one happens quickly, but you'll actually see there's quite a significant delay in the bottom. And so, so what, what's happening here, right? So I press it, again, it takes a while, shows up, and then I let go, and it actually still goes for a while. Now, why, why is that happening? So if you look at the flow graph, which is unfortunately very small right now, um, you see these arrows. Now, every arrow is actually a circular buffer. And in GNU Radio, those default to, I think, about 32 kilobytes, depending on, on circumstances. Um, but 32 kilobytes is, uh, is uh, 8,000 samples at, uh, when they're float numbers like this. So 8,000 samples at 32 kilosamples per second is, a, is a, you know, a quarter of a second. And now we have a whole bunch of them in a row. And you end up filling up all these buffers. Um, and, and actually, I'll show an even crazier case here, which is what happens if we, if we replace that with a vector operation. So I, all I do is I take that stream, turn it into a vector, and I turn the vector back into a stream. And but I chose a vector size of, I believe it's 137, which is a nice prime number. And what that does is it causes the, the buffers to become really big because they have to be multiples of 4,096 bytes. And so you find the least common multiple of 137 and 4,096, and it becomes really bad. So let's, let's, let's see what happens there. So I'll click on this. And you'll, you'll see it takes quite a significant amount of time before this stuff actually percolates through these giant buffers. And of course, it continues for quite a while after I've pressed it. I think this is something like eight seconds. Um, so clearly, clearly the, there's an issue. So how do we solve that within GNU Radio? Um, and actually, oops, let's, let's bring this back. So, so, so what causes this? Well, we have, at the beginning of the flow graph, we have our action, right? It, it's a modulation, but then, the, the scheduler does its best to percolate things through the flow graph and keep the buffers full so that everything moves along as quickly as possible. But what that means is that you now have many, many buffers full of samples that you've already made your decision on whether the, what their amplitude is. And when you change that, you, th those all have to go out the audio sync or UHD or, or you know, to whatever hardware before that can change. And so, um, so you end up with this long delay. And uh, what Skybox had, it, they had a similar problem. It's a little harder to show, but um, what they were doing was they had a telemetry stream up to their satellite. And the telemetry stream, what it needed to do was, it, first it was a continuous uh, PSK signal. And when they had data to send, they would send data. And when they had no data to send, they had to send idles to keep synchronization. So they sent an idle signal. But what happened is when you, when you mux those together in GNU Radio, the idle can be computed way, way, way in advance because it's, it's not changing. And your data has to wait for the actual data to arrive. And so what you ended up doing was filling up a huge buffer with idles. And so that caused, uh, you know, when there actually was data to send, it took quite a while. I, I think they were on the order of four seconds before it would get sent. Um, there's another company um, also in, in, uh, in an allied uh, field, let's say, that had a, um, 
uh, they were making a self-destruct signal, like, oh, what happens if our hardware is going to, to hurt people? Well, we have to send it a self-destruct signal. But you want that uh, self-destruct signal to be, uh, if it goes away, you also need to do a self-destruct because you can't, you, 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 need, you still need a positive, um, uh, a, 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 a sort of a positive acknowledgement. So, so what they did was they send, they send a continuous don't self-destruct signal. And then when they need a self-destruct, then they change it and they say, send a self-destruct. Well, what happens if you're sending that through a flow graph and you build up a whole big buffer full of don't, don't self-destruct, it now takes five, six, 10 seconds to actually do the self-destruct and somebody could get hurt in the meantime. So this is a dead man switch kind of problem. And so they, they also suffered from this issue. So the, um, the, the solution, or, or well, really the cause is, again, as I said, the, the um, the buffers, and, and if you really want to get a, a good deep understanding of how this all works, I would suggest reading this uh, article by Marcus uh, on the GNU Radio uh, blog that uh, really explains it pretty well. But um, the, 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 uh, the basic concept is that because you have this slow sync at the end, you know, whether it's a radio or audio or whatever, um, everything, the schedule just does its best to move things along, and so you end up filling these buffers. So, so what are the solutions? So the solution, the first, first one everybody says and everyone tries is to shrink the buffers. And this can help a little bit. Um, and you can use the set max output buffer, number of items, and stuff like that. But the reality is it's still a problem. If you have a lot of, you, you, there's a certain minimum size that the buffers can function at. And if you have a lot of them, they're going to add up anyway. And at a low sample rate, or, um, or if latency, if your latency requirements are close to your sample size, um, uh, then you have uh, an issue with that, right? And, uh, you know, this is not in, we're not talking like absolute numbers of milliseconds here. We're talking, it's relative to your number of samples. So if, even if you're running in a giga sample per second, uh, if, if you, you know, if you need, a, you know, a millisecond latency, that's not hard, even if the buffers fill up. But if you're running, but if you need a, a microsecond of latency at a giga sample per second, that's hard. And if you're running at a kilosample in this, in this demos I'm showing here, you know, a millisecond is hard. And so, um, so it, it's easy to show at the audio rates, but it's a real problem at, at all rates. So, uh, so shrinking buffers is not really a solution. You, the minimum size uh, buffers uh, can be too big because there's too many of them. And, and, and if you have an FFT in there, you can have a minimum size of a computation buffer, or there's many, many operations that require the minimum size. Um, it can be useful to control the scheduler-induced latency, though. So if you don't want to add the giant array of numbers all at once and you want to add them in smaller pieces, setting the, the output buffer size can help with that a little bit. Um, others have suggested to drop items already in flight. Um, that's, that's dangerous. There's not really a mechanism for doing that within um, GNU Radio. Uh, and it can create discontinuities, right? The, the, um, you know, in the self-destruct case, if all of a sudden everything resynchronizes because there's a rotation, because you, you swapped out of one modulated signal for another that's not synchronized, then that doesn't help you, right? So, um, so, so dropping items in flight doesn't really work. So, so really, I think the solution is to intelligently control the filling of the buffers. And uh, so we call that active latency management. And the idea is to you limit the number of in-flight items between your decision point and the consumption. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll show a, a little bit uh, of how that works here. So, so we have the same uh, flow graph that we used uh, for uh, the audio demonstration uh, earlier, but now this is the fixed version. So, so first I'll run it just to show that it, it actually does fix the issue. And you'll, you'll notice some, some tags on the, uh, on the streams here, but it's the same, uh, uh, but th th that's, that's related to how we solve the problem, and I'll get into that. So now you can see everything happens pretty quickly, right? There, there, even though we've got, in, in this flow graph, we've got the same stream to vector, the same pile of adders, and the same total amount of buffering in the whole system. Uh, in, in fact, there's a slightly more buffers uh, in there because there's a couple of additional blocks. But the, the latency is, is quite controlled. And now, now when we ran it, you, you did see there's, a, there's, a tiny, there's still a tiny delay that you can tell, but um, if I, if I, that's, that's really controlled by the, um, these, these stream to vectors here. So I'll get those out and then I can, 
um, actually reduce the latency further to the point that you can't even really see it. Also, you notice that the display got faster. And, and, and what's happening is here, we're, we're so we're, we are chunking the data in smaller pieces here, and that's actually causing the displays to run at the speed that you actually ask them. If you ever noticed in the Qt GUI blocks, or, or this one in particular, if you say, I want to see it at 60 hertz, you don't actually see anything at 60 hertz. And, and we've always sort of assumed, oh, that's because they're not fast enough to, it, it's not true. You actually can display them at 60 hertz. The problem is the way they're dropping samples is, is, is uh, related to the buffering issue. So, so we're actually getting full 60 hertz display here and everything happens quite quickly. Um, so now how did, how did we do that? So if we look at the, the display or, or if we look at the blocks here, um, it's the exact same flow graph except um, we added two things. One is this tag to message at the end. And all this does is, is it takes tags off of the stream and if they match a filter, it sends it out as a message. So it's basically, it's a null sync where we, um, we grab the tags and, and send, them, send them out to a recipient. So you just tell it, and in this case, I, you can't read it probably, but it says the tag I'm filtering for is latency strobe. So it takes those, it sends them, and you can sort of see the, the line and it comes back to this latency manager block at the beginning. Now, if you look at latency manager, it asks you a couple of things. Um, first, you know, obviously type and length, but the important things are maximum tags in flight and tagging interval. And so what this says is, what, what this does is, it, it puts, places a tag on what it passes through every uh, tagging interval number of samples. So every 10 samples, it's putting a tag on here. Now, every 10 is quite a bit for, for anything fast, but for audio, you, you know, 10 samples is not so hard for the processor to keep up. And then it says, I'm only allowed to have five tags in flight. So what does that mean? It, it means I, I can write out five tags worth of data, which would be 50 samples, right, five times 10, and I can't write out any more data or tags until I get a message back that one of those tags has been consumed at the opposite end. So once, that, once one comes back, I can send one more out, which would be 10 more samples. And so you, you, you're basically creating a flow control that doesn't rely on back pressure between the blocks to, to keep everything from filling up. And this is actually very similar to what uh, USERP uses between UHD on the host and the physical hardware on, on, um, uh, across the ethernet, right? We send out the samples, and only when they're consumed, the, the usurp itself says, okay, I finished those, you, I've got more space, and you can send more. And that, and that actually is because Ethernet does not have flow control, or it has flow control, but it doesn't work for, for um, any realistic application. Um, and you should never use Ethernet flow control, it's evil. We did that in very, very early days of usurp 2. Um, and instead, uh, anything that you, you sent across would, would get dropped, because there's no back pressure. And so we had to build our own back pressure uh, into the, into the, back into the host code in GNU Radio by, by doing this flow control over the wire. And so all I've done here is extend that style of flow control to the flow graph. And so this controls um, you know, how much is in flight. So in this case, 50 items is in flight. Now, um, obviously, you know, to, to lower the latency, you would have the minimum number, right? So we could put you know, one tag with one sample in it. But what happens if you, do, if you make it too low is that you're, you're now, you now consume a sample and you have nothing waiting after it, right? So, so you have to have a, sort of a minimum amount of latency and that's really controlled by um, how fast the processing happens. So if we have more and more complicated processing, we have to have a little bit more in flight um, because the, we, ha we can't attempt to make our buffer-induced latency hide the natural latency that the computation actually has. So if you have very complex computation there, you're gonna have to make the, you're gonna have to allow the buffers to cover that. Otherwise you'll get underruns. So with audio, it's actually very hard to, in, to create an underrun on the computer, but um, if I set this to one and one, uh, uh, or sorry, tagging interval, so let's, let's set it to one and one, which basically lets one sample out and it's consumed and then you can start the next one. Um, this actually may even work, or, or, or has some other issue, but um, uh, or, or let's let's make it really really small. Let's do two tags and an in interval of two. See if that okay. 
there's uh, what's that other one? Okay. Yeah, so you can make it incredibly small, and we, we don't see any audio underruns. If this was on a usurp, we might have to make it bigger because you might be consuming mega samples per second, and the, the natural processing is not going to be in the, in the nanoseconds. So, so you have to adjust that. So, but the bigger we make this, the more latency we add. So if we allow this, if I change this maximum tags to 2,000 tags in flight, and I only tag every you know, 1,000 samples, that's basically 2 million tags in flight, which is actually more than the latency uh, sorry, 2 million samples in flight, which is actually more than the size of the buffer. So this me makes it essentially do nothing, and we get back to our same issue of the long delay. So, so this allows you to control the maximum latency through there. Um, so how do, we, how do we do this? Um, let me go back to the presentation here. So really, it, the, the, um, the, the stream to tags block is, is, is pretty simple, so I won't bother with that. But this is the latency manager code itself. And you can see it's actually a very small work function. So this is a, a, uh, actually a sync block. Um, you, we didn't even need to use uh, you know, sort of a general work kind of function. But what we do is we copy the first, first thing we do is we figure out how many items are we allowed to send, which is the, the minimum of how many items do I have and how many items do I have left uh, in the, um, uh, it, it, based on the number of tokens I've received from the tags that come back. And based on that, we just copy the, those, we decrement our counters, we add tags on them as necessary, and, and we send it. And, and you will notice there's one uh, part here at the bottom. If we've copied nothing because we have no tokens, if we were to just return zero, we would immediately get called again and we'd spin lock on the, on the processor. So instead, we put a small sleep there. In this case, I, I think it's 100 microseconds. So you put that sleep so you don't keep getting called and, and waste uh, CPU. Um, and you can experiment with different sizes for that based on um, the, the latency. And for audio, we can put it, make it more like a millisecond. That's fine. Um, and the only other thing in here is there's a, a, a function in, um, in, there to, uh, in the block to receive the, uh, the tokens on the message port. And all it does is every time it receives a token that matches, it increments the counter. And every time we use one, we decrement the counter. And as long as you have your counter is greater than zero, you can send samples. So it's really straightforward. And actually, ideally, you know, lat latency manager as is will work in a lot of use cases. But um, this, this functionality really should be in, uh, put into your source block. Um, because what, what we end up with here is, um, the latency is actually controlled inside the graph, so between this, this feedback loop of, of this point to this point, but any latency outside there is uncontrolled. So uh, ideally everything is inside the loop and it's okay, but if it's not, um, it helps to, uh, to put this functionality directly in your ultimate source at the beginning, right? So if you have something that's deciding whether to send an idle message or, or the signal, you should that's where you should be receiving the tag so you know when you need the idle message, right? So this is more general, it's easy to drag and drop, but this is really functionality you should put in your source. Um, similarly, it, it would be useful to put the, the, um, the consumption of the tags in your sync itself. Because what happens here is this tag to message block sees the same buffer as the audio sync, but the audio sync you know, can allow that buffer to back up, and our tag to buffer is finding stuff at the beginning of the buffer that is not yet consumed. So you, you still have the, the buffer, sorry, the, yeah, the size of the buffer adding to your latency that's outside this loop. So ideally, this functionality of the tag to message should be included in the audio sync or the usurp sync or whatever uh, uh, is the ultimate consumer. And in that case, you have full, full um, you know, start to finish uh, latency control. So, so that's the code. So use cases, um, you'll see this in a lot of continuous transmission, so interactive signal generators, right? If you do too much processing and you slide your frequency slider, you'll see that the signal takes a while to move. Um, so signal generators, uh, a bunch of ham radio modes, CW, RTTY, PSK31, all have idle modes, and you'll run into this issue there. Uh, dead man switches, satellite uh, telemetry links, um, anytime you're muxing a bunch of data in a downlink um, on a satellite, uh, that sort of thing. Um, you can also use this to create a true priority mux, which you can't otherwise do uh, in GNU Radio. 
Um, so you send the high priority uh, when it's there and fill in with low priority when it's not. Um, also, this is very important for real-time control systems if you have hardware in the loop. Um, and you can actually extend this whole this concept to uh, mixed rate flow graphs. So if anybody has ever done the, you know, the sort of uh, canonical wideband FM receiver where you have a UHD source, the wideband FM DMOD, and then an audio sync, but the audio sample rate is not exactly 32,000, and the usurp sample rate is not exactly 100 million or whatever. And if, if, if the usurp's a little faster, then you build up a lot of samples in here, and then there's a lot of delay, uh, and eventually there's drops. Or if the usurp's a little slower and the, the audio sync is a little faster, then then you get audio clicks and underruns because there's not enough samples percolating through. So what, what you need to do there is, um, is, the, uh, is an, uh, a controlled resampler. And so this is a, you know, a hypothetical diagram. Instead of sending the wideband FM receiver to the audio sync, you would send it through a latency manager that had an output that controlled a fractional resampler. And so you don't just have to control for not more than a certain number of buffers, uh, the data items in flight, but you can also control for not less than a certain number of data items in flight. And so if there's too few data items in flight, you, you slow down your resampler or you make it generate more outputs for the same input. And if, it's, if there's too many in flight, you, you do the reverse and you make it f output fewer items for the input. And if you do it properly and you smooth that out, um, it, it's not perceivable to the user. And this is actually how uh, how things effectively work in, um, like when you do Bluetooth audio, for example, right? The, the Bluetooth clock and the audio clock are not synchronized, and if the audio is, is running too fast, you'd get clicks. And so you do this in, in software in that case, but you can, um, uh, but you have to sort of slide your sample rate clock uh, to uh, effectively long-term average match the the uh, the hardware clock uh, simply by doing this resampling. So. Uh, you can, and uh, finally, you can also uh, handle underruns nicely. So if, if you actually really do have some complex processing that has a lot of natural latency and you find that you don't have a sample to send, the latency manager can then automatically insert uh, or, or automatically control the, um, the resampler so that, uh, so that you can sort of spread out those, those symbols that you've already created and, and uh, um, you know, not end up with underruns and clicks and pops and things like that. So, uh, as I said, limitation is that it only, only controls buffers within the feedback loop. So really, your source should implement the manager and your sync should report the tags. Um, and actually, ideally, uh, you, would, you would use the actual consumption of the sample all the way at the endpoint. So UHD could be extended to uh, report not when it has sent the data out to um, to the hardware and, and has consumed it in the flow graph, but it can report the tag when the, that sample has been sent to the DAC. And, and, and it's already part of the flow control, so it's really, it doesn't even need to change in the FPGA, it only needs a change in the usurp sync, or the UHD sync, to, um, to report the tag back at the right time. And that would allow you to control, because even if you control this, this latency it, within your, the flow graph you see in GNU Radio, if you then have a megabyte of buffering in your hardware, it's not going to help, right? You'll still have a, a huge amount of buffering there. So you can, you can make it full round trip. So keep everything in the control loop, and, and you can uh, uh, you know, control the whole latency. So audio syncs and UHD syncs would ideally have this uh, capability as well. So um, the actual implementation of this code, uh, Derek uh, worked uh, with me while we were in uh, Berlin a few weeks ago. Uh, so thanks to Derek uh, for that. And you can find the code on, uh, on his GitHub. Uh, and uh, you can contact him in email. And, and like apparently everybody else here, I am hiring. Um, I work at Apple, although not on this specific uh, project. Um, and we're looking for interns and full time and anybody who's into communication systems and software engineering. So anyway, thank you and uh, yep, let's, thank, let's thank Matt. We have two minutes for questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yep. Is that Richard? Do you think this solution is something we can kind of build into Guinea Radio without thinking about it anymore, or is it always going to be a case by case? You have to just do it when you need it. Uh, I, as in, I mean, I, I think the best way to handle that would be 
to make it the default that syncs report tags for consumption and that sources uh, act or sources receive them and do something intelligent with them. Um, there's a lot of cases where you don't like run into this. So if you have a, just a truly bursty communication system that does nothing in between, this won't really affect that. Um, it, it really only affects the cases where you're, you're, you're making a decision about what to generate um, uh, and, and you, you need that to percolate very quickly, but you're continuously generating something otherwise. So, um, so I, I would like to see it standardized that hardware interfaces at the end report the tags and, and then your source can, can handle it and you know, make these blocks part of the standard uh, distribution. Any other questions? No? All right, with that then, we are going to break for lunch. Thank you. See you all back here in an hour. Thanks again, Matt.